Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. The centerpiece of climate alarmism is the temperature record. Without a scary looking temperature record, the EPA CO2 endangerment finding can't exist. What the people pushing climate alarm want to show is that things are heating up really fast. A graph which showed the opposite would be very bad for them. This video is titled, Erasing America's Hot Past. I'm going to go into a lot of detail in this video showing my research over the last 10 years of how the U.S. temperature record has been systematically altered to cool the past and warm the present. So grab some popcorn. Massive deadly heat waves were very common in the United States before the 1960s. Some of the more famous ones occurred in 1896, 1901, 1911, 1913, and many years during the 1930s. The heat waves of 1936 were probably the worst ones. Here's an article from July 25th, 1936. Heat wave toll over 12,086 cities this week. That's pretty incredible. And the heat wave of 1896 lasted for 10 days and killed nearly 1,500 people just in New York City. There were many heat waves around the world in 1896, including the worst heat wave on record in Southeast Australia. The heat wave of 1911 brought 100 degree temperatures for days to New England and killed thousands of people there. This slide shows heat wave graphs and maps from the National Climate Assessment. The upper left graph shows the length of heat waves in the United States since the year 1900. You see that they peaked during the 1930s with a huge spike. The lower left graph shows heat wave magnitude, which also peaked during the 1930s with a huge spike and have plummeted since then. This map shows the change in the warmest temperature of the year. Blue dots show places that have cooled. As you can see, most of the places in the United States don't get as hot as they used to. And the lower right graph is the warmest temperature of the year. As you can see, most of the U.S. used to get over 100 degrees during the 1930s, with a huge spike in 1936, when the average peak temperature across the United States was an incredible 105 degrees. Heat like that is completely inconceivable now. The EPA heat wave graph shows the same thing. A huge spike in heat waves in 1930, 1931, 1934, and 1936. Nothing has come close since then. And here's another map from the EPA showing how the U.S. has cooled. It's titled, Change in Unusually Hot Temperatures in the Contiguous 48 States from 1948 to 2015. Blue dots show places where it's cooled. As you can see, most of the U.S. has cooled. Orange dots show places that have warmed. There's not very many of them. Climate scientists are obviously aware of the fact that the U.S. doesn't get as hot as it used to. They're the ones who created these graphs and maps. But the next graph is our first hint of trouble. This graph is also from the EPA website, and it's based on the NOAA Climate Extremes Index. Figure 2, area of contiguous 48 states with unusually hot summer temperatures. And they show recent years as being much hotter than the 1930s. But we know that isn't true. Maps from the EPA and the National Climate Assessment show the exact opposite. Most of the U.S. doesn't get as hot as it used to. I spent years looking at the NOAA U.S. temperature data, and I've written all kinds of software to analyze it. This graph is complete nonsense. It has no basis in science. So this is where our journey into the destruction of the U.S. temperature record begins. Here's the actual data from the NOAA United States Historical Climatology Network. That consists of 1,218 stations around the United States. The blue bars are the percent of summer days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees centigrade. As you can see, they peaked during the 1930s. Similarly, the red bars are the percent of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. You can see they also peaked during the 1930s. And the yellow bars are percent of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit which you can also see had a huge peak during the 1930s and have dropped off sharply since then. You can see that the U.S. doesn't get anywhere near as hot as it used to 80 years ago. And recent years have been near record lows. It's very likely that this summer will turn out to be the coolest summer in the United States since at least 1895. 
And you've probably noticed that my graph is very similar to the graphs from the National Climate Assessment. But now we're going to go back into the world of data which lacks any credibility. This is NOAA's official U.S. temperature graph which shows recent years much hotter than the 1930s. It is theoretically possible that this graph could be accurate. Suppose winters had warmed up a lot more than summers. Then we might see a shape like this. Now we're going to have a look at that. In 1989, NOAA issued a report which was reported in the New York Times. U.S. data since 1895 failed to show warming trend. After examining climate data extending back nearly 100 years, a team of government scientists has concluded that there's been no significant change in average temperatures or rainfall in the United States over that entire period. In other words, the United States climate is not changing. The study made by scientists for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, was published in the current issue of Geophysical Research Letters. It is based on temperature and precipitation readings taken at weather stations around the country from 1895 to 1987. This is what's now known as the United States Historical Climatology Network. So they said there was no warming in the United States from 1895 to 1987. Well, let's look at the current NOAA graph for that same period. Well, now they do show warming from 1895 to 1987. What's happened is that they have altered the data. Most of the rest of this video is going to be exploring the alterations which NOAA is making to the data. Ten years after the NOAA 1989 report which said there was no warming in the United States, NASA's James Hansen made another report. In this report, NASA actually showed quite a bit of cooling in the United States since the 1930s. James Hansen was the guy from NASA who in 1988 testified before Congress and warned about severe heat and drought in the United States, yet he saw that the exact opposite was occurring. And he was not happy about it. He wrote, How can the absence of clear climate change in the United States be reconciled with continued reports of record global temperature? In the U.S. there has been little temperature change in the last 50 years, the time of rapidly increasing greenhouse gases. In fact, there was a slight cooling throughout much of the country. Hansen was a very strong believer in global warming and was obviously quite troubled about the fact that his own graph showed that the U.S. was cooling. Relative to the whole world, the U.S. isn't that big, but it's very important for the global temperature record. This map shows why. This map is from NOAA's Global Historical Climatology Network and it shows the number of stations which had daily temperature data in 1920 all around the world. As you can see, there are a lot of stations in the United States, some in Europe, some in Australia, and very few anywhere else in the world. In fact, the United States is the only large area in the world which has a very good long-term coherent temperature record. So if we go back to Hansen's paper from 1999, he showed the very good temperature record of the United States cooling and the very poor temperature record of the world heating. And he was upset about this. So what did he do? Did he fix the global temperatures? No, he altered the U.S. temperatures. This was Hansen's 1999 U.S. temperatures. He showed 1934 correctly as the hottest year and 1998 as being much cooler. But shortly after 1999, the data magically changed. Now let's look at the current version of the same graph. Wow, 1934 got a lot cooler and 1998 got a lot warmer. I'm going to go back and forth between these two a few times so you can see how Hansen altered the data. 1999, 2019. 1999, cooling. 2019, warming. He massively altered the data to turn cooling into warming. Well, that's one way to get rid of data which doesn't support your theory. You just change it to make it support your theory. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said, It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't match experiment, it's wrong. And if climate scientists were actual scientists, they would abide by this principle rather than altering the data. Now we're going to go into the details of the alteration, which are actually being done by NOAA rather than NASA. The blue line is the raw data from NOAA's U.S. Historical Climatology Network. 
Shows a lot of cooling since the 1930s, with this year looking like it's going to be the coolest on record. But the red line is what they call their final data set, which is what they release to the public. It shows a strong warming trend. As you can see, they cooled the past and they warmed the present. That's how they created the warming trend from a cooling trend. The next graph shows the alterations that are being made. Everything to the left of the year 2000 has been cooled progressively, and all temperatures to the right of the year 2000 are being rapidly warmed. This is a hockey stick of alterations, with the alterations coming faster and faster as the U.S. gets cooler and cooler. This next graph is the same as the previous one, plotting the adjustments being made by NOAA over time, but this time instead of plotting time along the x-axis, I'm plotting atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And this one's the real smoking gun. This perfectly straight line with an R-squared of 0 0.978 shows us that the data is being altered exactly to match their theory. As CO2 increases, they ramp their data tampering up to exactly match it. This sort of data tampering is what is commonly known as policy-based evidence making. They're altering the data precisely to match their theory. Now we're going to take a closer look at the data tampering which is actually being done. It's not all done in one step, but there's actually two steps to the process. Remember the blue line is the raw temperature data and the red line is the final temperature data. But there's a step in between called time of observation bias or TOBE. This is basically the same graph as I showed you before. The red line shows the total adjustments being made in the final data set, but the blue line shows the adjustments that are being made in the time of observation bias step. As you can see, they're not as large, about half a degree Fahrenheit. The total adjustment is now up close to two degrees from one end to the other. Time of observation bias is based on the theory that in the past people used to reset their min-max thermometers once per day and they used to do it mainly in the afternoon. But NOAA believes that over time more and more people started resetting thermometers in the morning and fewer and fewer people were doing it in the afternoon. Now let's look at why that's important. This graph is the actual temperature data for Boulder, Colorado taken every five minutes for the last 28 days. It's from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. You can see that it was hot on July 15, 16, and 17, but then a cold front came through and it got a lot cooler on July 18. So suppose that instead of having readings every five minutes, you only took readings once per day from a min-max thermometer, and you reset it once right at the peak temperature of the day. Let's see what the consequences of that would be. So in this experiment, we're going to reset our thermometer at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon on July 17th. And what happens is we get a temperature of 95 degrees for July 17th, and we also get a temperature of 95 degrees for July 18th, even though July 18th was much cooler. So what happens is if you reset your thermometer too close to the afternoon maximum, you're going to tend to double count hot days. July 18th should have showed up as a cool day, but because you reset your thermometer right here, you recorded 95 degrees as the maximum temperature for July 18th. This is not a subtle problem. I had a min-max thermometer when I was 7 years old, and it took me about one day to realize that you have to reset the thermometer twice per day. You have to reset the minimum in the afternoon, and you have to reset the maximum in the morning. That's the only way you're going to get accurate temperatures for both the min and the max every day. If you reset the thermometer only once per day in the afternoon, you'll tend to double count warm days. If you reset it only once per day in the morning, you'll do the opposite. You'll tend to double count cold days. Either way is bad practice. The only sensible way to do it is to reset the thermometer twice a day. The time of observation bias adjustment, shown here as the blue line, assumes that people weren't very bright in the past, and that they couldn't figure out what I figured out when I was seven years old. Now let's look at the history of the adjustment. This is what NOAA was using 20 years ago. The black line is the time of observation bias adjustment. You can see that it was a total of about 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit, and that it leveled off after the year 1990. They didn't increase it anymore after the year 1990. But here's their current version of the adjustment. 
Now it's about 0 0.3 degrees Celsius rather than Fahrenheit, so they've just about doubled the adjustment, even though they claim otherwise. They say, this net effect is about the same as that of the Tobe adjustments in version 1, which is to be expected since the same adjustment method is used in both versions. But in reality, the adjustment is nearly twice as large as it was in version 1. The black line is version 1, 1999, and the blue line is the current version in 2019. Remember that in 1999 it tailed off after the year 1990, but now it goes up in a hockey stick. I've gotten used to NOAA documentation not matching their data. There's nothing new about that. But now let's take a closer look at the time of observation bias adjustment. I ran an experiment to test out whether their adjustment was valid. July 1936 was the hottest month on record in the United States, and particularly in the Midwest. So what I did was I divided up all the stations in Missouri into two groups. One group was the stations which recorded their temperatures in the morning, and the other group was stations which recorded their temperatures in the afternoon. The reason I use Missouri is because it's a small state with the stations close together, they have a lot of stations, they have a very high quality temperature record, and they have a nearly even split of morning stations and afternoon stations from July 1936. The blue line is the daily average maximum temperature during summer 1936 for all stations which reset their thermometers in the morning. And the red line is the same thing for all afternoon stations. First thing to notice is that it was extremely hot. A lot of days over 100 degrees and some days over 110 degrees. And remember this isn't just peak temperatures at one station. This is the average of many stations. On one day in 1936, the average temperature of all the stations in Missouri was over 110 degrees. That's pretty incredible. But for the sake of this experiment, the thing to notice is that the red lines and the blue lines are very similar. We don't see any indication of double counting. If there was double counting going on, what we would see is that during times when temperature was falling, like here and here, the red line would be extended way out past the blue line but we don't see that. There's no indication that double counting is going on here, which is the basis of time of observation bias adjustment. In a minute, we're going to look at the small discrepancies between the morning stations and the afternoon stations. But first, I want to show you this yellow graph. What this is is temperatures in Missouri this year. You can see how much cooler it is this year than it was in 1936. This summer has had no extremely hot weather in Missouri and has averaged about 13 degrees cooler than 1936. That's pretty incredible. And it's occurring during a time when climate alarmists are trying to convince Americans that they're burning up and that it's the hottest year ever. Climate alarmism is completely dependent on the public being ignorant about history. Exactly as Orwell wrote in his novel 1984. Now we're going to look at the small discrepancy between morning stations and afternoon stations in Missouri. This is the average summer maximum temperature for all Missouri stations every summer since 1895. The red line is the afternoon stations from 1936, and the blue line is the morning stations from 1936. As you can see, the afternoon stations were a little bit warmer than the morning stations. Both sets of stations show a strong cooling trend since 1895, and the slope is nearly identical for both sets. If time of observation bias was really having an effect, this is not what we would be seeing. The blue line would be sloping upwards rapidly if the Midwest was really warming, as climate alarmists claim. My first reaction when I saw this graph was that perhaps time of observation bias is having an effect because the afternoon stations are a little bit warmer than the morning stations. So I took a closer look at the two sets of stations and I plotted out the average latitude of the two sets. The red line once again is afternoon stations and the blue line is morning stations. And I saw something very interesting. The average latitude of the afternoon stations is a little bit closer to the equator, so of course they're warmer than the morning stations. The meteorological rule of thumb is that if you go one degree latitude south, you get about one degree Celsius warming, or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So the entire discrepancy between the afternoon stations and the morning stations can be explained by differences in latitude. 
It looks to me like time of observation bias has absolutely no effect on the stations in Missouri. And if it doesn't work in Missouri, it's not going to work anywhere else. So I think we've established that the time of observation bias problem is either exaggerated or non-existent. Now let's look at the other adjustment which Noah is making, which is the final adjustment. The blue line shows the time of observation bias temperatures, and the red line shows the final temperatures. So you can see that the final temperatures are tampered with quite a bit more than the time of observation bias temperatures are. But there's something even more interesting going on here. Since about the year 2000, the time of observation bias temperatures have been dropping, but the final temperatures have been going up. So there's something very interesting going on over the last 20 years. This graph shows the difference between the final temperatures from NOAA and the time of observation bias adjusted temperatures. And you can see that since the year 2000, there's a hockey stick. The final temperatures are going up much faster than time of observation bias temperatures, which have actually been going down. NOAA's final adjustments are very poorly documented, and as it turns out, they're just largely black magic, as I'm about to show you. A certain percentage of the 1,218 United States Historical Climatology Network stations don't report every month. This is the temperature record for 2019 from Brewston Hill, West Virginia. NOAA says that the station isn't reporting or that they're unhappy with the data for some reason. And every month so far this year, they've put an E on it. Then what they do is they use a computer model to generate a temperature. So for January, they created a temperature of 13.14 degrees Celsius at Brewston, West Virginia. For February, they made it 12.08 degrees Celsius. Who knows where these numbers are actually coming from, but they say it's not coming from an actual thermometer. The graph at the bottom is the key one. It shows the percent of stations marked with an E for every year from 1970 until the present. Back in the 1970s, less than 10% of the stations generally were marked with an E, but now we're up to almost 50%. So what that tells us is that almost half of the data now is being fabricated by NOAA. So look at this hockey stick after the year 2000. They went from about 30% fabricated data up to almost 50%. And that hockey stick of fabricated data almost exactly matches the hockey stick of temperatures seen in the graph showing the difference between the final data set and the time of observation bias data set. So this massive spike in temperatures of almost one degree since the year 2000 is due to NOAA simply making up data. It's not real. By making up data, NOAA can create any shaped graph they desire. It's the equivalent of a losing sports team being allowed to go in and alter the score to anything they want after the contest is over. In that case, Los Angeles wins the Super Bowl and the World Series. So remember, this all started out with Hansen being concerned that the US temperatures were cooling while the global temperatures were warming. So they started altering the data, and now it's just turned into this giant mess where they just make up any numbers that they want. Now let's look again at the massive tampering which NOAA and NASA are doing to the temperature data. This is the real data, and this is the fake data. Real, fake. Real, cooling, fake, warming. The whole thing is a massive fraud. Also remember that the U.S. temperature data is by far the best temperature data set in the world, and that there's almost no long-term high-quality data for much of the rest of the world. The data is being very precisely altered to match carbon dioxide theory. As carbon dioxide increases, the magnitude of their tampering increases linearly with the carbon dioxide. All this data tampering is being done to make the very high quality U.S. temperature record match the very low quality global temperature record. And then here comes the punchline. The fake global temperature record was used to create the hockey stick and erase the medieval warm period in the Little Ice Age. There's a massive coordinated fraud going on here. And then this fake hockey stick in Michael Mann's graph forms the basis of the EPA endangerment finding. And the EPA CO2 endangerment finding forms the basis of shutting down fossil fuels in the United States and taking over control of the energy industry. This is exactly what President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell speech in 1961, the speech which was commonly known as his military-industrial complex speech. 
But he also said, the prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. So let's look at what's happened. Many billions of dollars have been poured into research grants to academics to push global warming. That money is being used to generate fake data, which has become the basis of the CO2 endangerment finding. And the CO2 endangerment finding is being used to seize control of the U.S. energy supply. Isn't this what Eisenhower said? We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Some people will try to ignore this and say, that's just conspiracy theory. But the Democrats are quite open about their plans to seize control of the U.S. energy supply. They have the Green New Deal, which was signed off by more than 100 Democrats. And I attended the first House subcommittee hearing on the climate crisis this week in Boulder. And the Democrats were extremely open about their plans to seize control of the U.S. energy industry. They're doing it right in front of our faces. They package it in pretty green colors, but right underneath the surface is a hostile takeover of one of the foundations of our civilization, a reliable energy supply. If your goal is to control people, which is what progressives want to do, what better way to do it than to make sure they don't have enough energy? Then they can't travel, they can't communicate, and you have complete control over their lives. We need to regain control of what's going on in our country. And the key to it is shutting down the CO2 endangerment finding and shutting down this global warming scam. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science, propaganda, and organized crime for a long time.